straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. A Derek Chauvin trial juror faces new scrutiny over questions of impartiality. Was important information not disclosed during jury selection? What Mr. Uh, Mitchell has done is he's given uh, more fuel for the appellate fire. The Ohio man on trial accused of murdering his roommate and burning the body to cover it up. But was it killing in self-defense? He told lie after lie, lie on top of lies. The officers being hailed as heroes for rushing a 13-year-old shooting victim to the hospital in the back of their cop car. Stay with us. He was in and out of consciousness, so we're trying to keep him alive and keep him up. And check out the moves on this so-called freestyling felon. Why police in Florida say his celebration might be short-lived. Plus, dramatic testimony as a man describes being shot in the head and surviving. Day two of the Wisconsin trial of Joshua A. And I seen that uh, red dot thing kind of with head away. Right? But my nose here. And I just dove down and tried. It's raising questions about whether or not Mitchell should have ever made it on the jury at all. Is everything that you answered on that questionnaire true and correct? Yes. All right. That was prospective juror number 52 during jury selection. We now know he's Brandon Mitchell. Mitchell's uncle posted a photo of him last August on Facebook. Mitchell is wearing a t-shirt marked, get your knee off our necks with a photo of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and BLM. Mitchell was asked about his feelings about Black Lives Matter during jury selection. I don't know Black Lives Matter as an organization. Okay. That's, I, don't, I don't know it as an organization, so maybe that's, I mean, I don't know if that's how the question said. I don't know if it said Black Lives Matter organization. I don't, I don't view it as that, so I don't, okay. that's not how I subscribe to that. Mitchell said he could be impartial and wanted to be on the jury because it was a historic moment. Former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi says the Facebook post could be problematic. The T-shirt to me, if I'm a defense attorney for Derek Chauvin, the T-shirt to me suggests that he thinks that the person who took the life of George Floyd should be found guilty. Mitchell told a Minneapolis TV station the photo of him is from a rally in Washington, D.C. last summer that commemorated Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. And George Floyd's family spoke there briefly, but he would have attended even if Floyd hadn't died. Mitchell spoke to Law and Crime last week. Man, I started figuring out right away. Third degree took maybe three and a half hours. And then uh, the second degree murder, we figured out in maybe 30, 45 minutes. Former Hennepin County Public Defender Mary Moriarty says Judge Cahill could hold a Schwartz hearing at the request of Derek Chauvin. Mitchell would be questioned by the judge about his answers on the questionnaire to see whether he tried to hide attending that event. Would the defense have tried to excuse him um, because he participated, if they knew that he participated in this march commemorating Martin Luther King, uh, or is that just uh, another piece of who he was, which was fairly clear, I think, in the questionnaire and in the questioning. And if that's the case, the, the judge would not declare a mistrial. Now, I reached out to Brandon Mitchell and have not yet heard back from him. His questionnaire remains sealed by the court, as do all of the other juror questionnaires. And it's not clear whether or not defense attorney Eric Nelson will request one of these Schwartz hearings. I've reached out to him and the attorney general's office in Minnesota, and neither one have gotten back to me. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Gigi Gonzalez and Terry Austin. Gigi, if he lied on the questionnaire, then I can see Nelson having grounds for an appeal. But Mitchell said he was favorable to Black Lives Matter, but could be impartial. Is that not the ultimate question here? Exactly. And, you know, I don't know if he actually lied on the questionnaire because Mitchell says that he was attending the voter registration rally and not the protest. So unless the question was phrased as something like, were you at any protest or uh, similar activities, and he lied about it, then maybe Nelson's got a shot here. But, you know, it seems that Mitchell was forthright in his position with Black Lives Matter, and that really is uh, to the crux of the point here. So I don't know if this would be successful on appeal based on what we know right now. Now, Terry, Nelson had peremptory challenges. He could have uh, gotten rid of, of Mitchell and surprised it even made it. But the court could also argue that, well, you could have removed them with one of your challenges and you didn't. Could that argument be fatal for the defense? I think that the judge or the court could ask that question, but I don't think that's the real issue because the real issue is whether or not there was jury misconduct and whether or not he lied during the voir dire or the questionnaire. On the questionnaire, he checked the box and said 
he really had no opinion about Black Lives Matter during the questioning in the voir dire. He said the same thing. And at the demonstration, you know, he had a T-shirt, and he says that it was because it was for Martin Luther King. So I don't think that this is enough for a mistrial. I think it could be viewed as all very consistent statements. No, Anjanette, are there any particular responses by Mitchell that you think could help Chauvin's defense in trying to get a mistrial here? You know, I don't know if any of this is helpful to the defense. There may just be such overwhelming evidence in the court's mind or the appellate court's mind that they feel like this wasn't that big of a deal and it wouldn't have changed the verdict had he been stricken from the jury pool. But it is interesting, though, that this T-shirt surfaces. It is talking about the knee on the neck and get your knee off of our necks. And that really is a statement that emanated and originated from the death of George Floyd. So you could construe it as, what, as you know, advocating for the position that he did cause or he believed he did, Chauvin did cause the death. But he did say he could be impartial. So it'll be really interesting to see if the defense actually pursues this. Yeah, and Angela, you bring up a great point there of harmless error that this could have been an error, but the overwhelming evidence could have been so much that it kind of covers up that error. That's another great point. Thank you all. And be sure to tune in to the Law and Crime Network this Friday at 9 p.m. for an hour-long special on the Derek Chauvin trial hosted by our very own Anjanette Levy. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, what's the man? That's the man who shot. missing on July 25th, 2020. But deputies at the Hawking County Sheriff's Office quickly realized he hadn't been seen in weeks. Investigators believe his roommate, Michael Dixon, shot Whitaker, cut his body, and burned his body with helping her father cover up the murder. Michael Dixon is also charged with sexually assaulting his daughter, Melody Sue. The first responding deputy says he became suspicious when Whitaker's daughter handed him what appeared to be a suicide note. Took pictures. Um, contacted a detective after I'd been there only after about 15 minutes. I did not have a positive feeling about the case. Um, and then uh, after speaking with them, I also received a letter from Julie. She gave me a letter that was a, a sample letter that she identified as her, her father's handwriting. She had digital photographs of something that she was claiming was a suicide note um, that was allegedly written by her father. She had that in digital format, and she so that wasn't her father's handwriting, and she w emailed that to me. I received that the following day on the 26th. So I wanted to have something that she identified as a known um, item that she identified as her father's handwriting to have as a possible comparison in the future. On cross-examination, the defense asked the lieutenant about the extent of his involvement in this case. You said that you were there for about two hours total? That is correct. And that during your time there, you didn't see anything out of the ordinary? Correct. Outside of the pictures you took? That is correct. Okay. And you said that the only time you'd seen Mr. Whitaker was in 2018? Yes. That was about two years prior to this? Correct. Okay. So you have no idea what he looked like really in those two years just from what you'd seen earlier? Yes. Okay. Did you have any other interaction with Mr. Whitaker? No. Do you know anything else about him or his home or anything of that nature? No, I do not. And after this two hours you were involved, was that pretty much the totality of your part of this investigation? That is correct. And the last thing was, I imagine that when you were sent out there on this missing persons, you probably looked in to see if there's anyone else who had made a missing persons report for Mr. Whitaker? Uh, I did not specifically try to search for someone who had made another report of that. No. Okay. But you weren't aware of anyone else who had made any previous reports that Mr. Whitaker was No, I was not. Back with us is criminal defense attorney Gigi Gonzalez and Terry Austin. Terry, this is a crazy story. Self-defense, I'm not sure if it's going to work, but how crazy would it be if Melody Sue testified that she was under duress and that she was actually being attacked by Whitaker? Could that help out uh, the Dixon case? Well, I think Michael Dixon is not going to prevail on his self-defense, but we'll have to see what the evidence says. I do think the daughter will be able to say that she was under duress and was helping her father really take care of the body and hide the corpse or burn the corpse or get rid of it in some way. She has to show really basically that there was a threat that she might be killed. And in fact, she feared for that. 
and there was no other way for her to escape. So I think she's the daughter. There's nothing else she can do. She could claim that she feared for her life, and that's why she helped her father cover this up. Yeah, that second trial will be interesting to watch. Gigi, it's the Gigi Gonzalez dirty hands but not bloody hands defense. Uh, admit to the dismemberment but not the murder. Uh, could it work in this case? I don't think so, Brian. And in order for him to make that defense fly, he's going to have to testify. And that's going to open up to some nasty cross-examination. He'll have to answer why didn't he go ahead and report the killing? Uh, who wrote that suicide note? Uh, there's a lot of really brutal questions he will have to answer for that I just really don't see him doing that well on the stand. So for those reasons, I do not think that the uh, dirty hands but no bloody hands will prevail here. Yeah, I agree. The defense would make more sense if you killed the man trying to harm your daughter and then you just called the police afterwards. I don't think there's a single person who would disagree with that argument, who would feel a different way about it. But as you pointed out, the note, the, uh, the chopping up of the body, that's going to make it a little messy. We'll see how that defense works out. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, hero cops out of Chicago, how two officers saved a 13-year-old boy. Plus, one suspected felon may have celebrated his crimes a little too early. The video you don't want to miss on the other side of this break. We're back. Two police officers in Chicago are being held as heroes for saving a 13-year-old boy shooting victim. Officer Julius Gibbons says he was out on patrol with his partner last week, responding to a report of shots fired when they were waved down and told a young man was shot. We rerouted to the backyard and across the street we saw a young man waving his hand saying that he was shot. Uh, we rushed over there. He told us his age was 13 years old. Uh, due to his injuries, we knew that uh, time was of the essence. That's when the duo jumped into action, picking the teen up and carrying him to their squad car. We have to go about 100, 200 feet carrying this kid back to our squad car. And Officer Ward did a great job carrying him the entire way. Officer Gibbons stayed with the teen in the back seat as Officer Rhonda Ward drove them to the hospital. Stay with me and we're going to make this trip together. And... He trusted us. No, we wanted him to, and we made it. We got there right on time for him. That was the main goal. And that's the only goal we had in hand, and we wanted him right there with us. Because we, due to the trauma, I know it, man, it was a lot. So we was like, man, stay with us. And he did just that. So he's a hero, too. The boy's in stable condition and is expected to be okay. Terry, quick thinking by these officers. Note these heroes hopefully saved this young man's life. What did you think when you first saw the story? You know, Brian, we need more stories just like this one, and I'm sure they are out there. The police are sworn to care and to protect, and they did just that. And, you know, I heard Officer Givens say that the age of the victim had something to do with his feelings, and it shows that he has empathy for the people that he's serving. And... Rhonda Ward, the other officer who drove the car and drove the young man to the hospital, she basically said that's why she became a police officer to save lives. So I think this was a great story, and I'm glad we were able to cover it. Exactly. So do I. Now to the Sunshine State, where Florida man strikes again. Police are asking for your help to find this so-called freestyling felon. Police in Port St. Lucie want to speak to Sean Gazzo and Carl Jackson. They say the pair were hired by an 86-year-old to move heavy furniture, but stole $10,000 worth of jewelry. They're accused of pawning the jewelry, and that's when police say Gazzo celebrated a bit prematurely. Detectives say Gazzo can be seen here on surveillance video outside the pawn shop dancing in the parking lot. Gazzo and Jackson are wanted for dealing in stolen property and theft. <laughs> Gigi, I'm looking at this as a defense attorney. Can you imagine the lineup video in this case? The officer comes on, uh, number four, can you dance for me, please? Uh, <laughs> yes, officer, that, that, that's the man right there. What did you make of this smooth criminal video? <laughs> well, you know what? This smooth criminal, he may be a smooth criminal, but he's definitely bad. Not Michael Jackson bad, just bad, bad. And let me tell you, St. Lucia does not play with your defendants. They throw the book at them. So if this judge catches a glimpse of this defendant's moves, uh, she's sure to throw the book at him, too, because they were not pretty. Yeah, and it looks like it could be ID quality video from inside uh, the pawn shop. But of course, I don't think anyone's going to mistake those dance moves ever again. Gigi, thank you very much. 
When we come back, one victim of an apparent love gone wrong shooting takes the stand. The compelling testimony. I Welcome back. Testifying before the man accused of trying to kill you. That's what one Wisconsin man did in court on Tuesday. Hey, we, he's shot? Okay. Hey, let's get you back here. Let's get you back here. Get back here. Get back here. Come on. John Miller was shot in the head August 4th, 2020, as he was trying to fix a car. He was there there, is, and uh, he looked at her and went towards her, her, and I was doing something, and then I saw her pop. And then he turned around and shot me. Okay. And hang over and hit the ground. I'm going to go get my phone just to have some pictures quick, okay? Miller was helping his friend's daughter, Rebecca Brokowski, repairing a car so she could return it to her ex-boyfriend. Brokowski called it quits after dating 39-year-old Joshua Aid for five years. The car was the last thing that tied them together. Hey, have you ever met their daughter that day? No. Or that morning, I should say? No, not at all. Okay. I mean, I knew they had four... Four kids, I believe. Okay. And you agreed to do that just as a favor? Yeah, yeah. In court, Miller identified the man who shot him as Joshua Aid. I turned, and there was a red thing staring at me, and I just went down like that and got shot in the face. And the man that you saw come up the driveway and that shot you in the face, do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Can you identify him by what he's wearing? He's wearing a gray suit, blue shirt, and a straight tie. The individual two to my left? Yes. Your Honor, I've asked that the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. On cross-examination, the defense asked Miller if he had a weapon and about his criminal history. You had armed yourself with a knife prior to going to Rebecca's house that afternoon, correct? No. Is your testimony that you did not have a knife on your person that day? I may have had a box cutter knife on me I usually carry. I may have had that. So you did have a knife on you? I honestly couldn't say. At the start of your testimony, you testified that you had, quote, about, end quote, 13 convictions. You have actually 13 convictions, correct? Yes. 57-year-old Miller was a friend of Brokowski's father, James Grutnier. Miller and Brokowski survived the shooting, but Grutnier was pronounced dead at the scene. Eight is on trial for murder and attempted murder. The Oshkosh, Wisconsin trial is set to last one week. Let's bring Terry and Gigi back one last time to discuss the Joshua Aid case. Now, Gigi, not one but two survivors testified in this murder trial. And as you and I have discussed outside of this show, uh, homicide trials are hard, but attempted homicide or attempted murder can be even harder because you have an actual victim take the stand. Now, how powerful was the testimony here in front of the jury? Incredibly powerful. Again, these are victims with personal knowledge of who the defendant is. They had a personal beef with the defendant and saw the defendant commit the act. The jurors are going to weigh their testimony uh, very much, and it's probably going to be the most powerful evidence uh, that they deliberate over here. Now, Terry, it seems like the prosecution's got everything. They've got the gun. They've got eyewitnesses. They've got a great theme that I think everyone can understand, that being the disgruntled um, ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend. Uh, it seems to be pretty uh, well falling in line for the prosecution. Uh, this trial is speeding along. With all of those facts, do you see a quick deliberation in this case as well? You know what, Brian? This trial has gone so quickly. The witnesses have gone up and down faster than I've ever seen before. I actually think that the deliberation could be longer than the trial itself, or at least longer than the prosecution's case. There was a lot of evidence presented, and these are very serious charges. Homicide, attempted homicide. I think the jury is going to take their time. They're going to go through the evidence. And there's a little bit of doubt here in terms of whether or not there was this extra gun that was on the premises. And so I think they're going to want to look at all of that and consider it. And it could take a little while for them to come back with the verdict of guilty or not guilty. And Terry, you heard there on that cross-examination, the defense asking uh, the witness or the complaining witness uh, in that cross-examination about whether or not he had a weapon on him. What did you make of that cross-examination and the response by the, by the witness that he had a box cutter or something of that nature? You know, Brian, that's where the doubt will come up. He should know whether he had a knife or a box cutter. That's not something that you forget about. And so I definitely think that he's 
raising some doubt. And I think it's something that the jury is going to think about whether or not this was in self-defense or whether or not this was just cold-blooded murder. Yeah, we'll see how that works out. Three against one, the one having a gun. We'll see how that self-defense plays out. Gigi, Terry, thank you very much.